way the Lord has been leading, and you really want to uh, preach on revival and, and the waters, and uh, there's a lot of things that can be preached, but uh, a, a couple of nights ago, I really felt that at some point there the night was preaching evangelistically. And I was thinking about all that was happening there, and I do have a message, I believe, a timely message coming up very soon uh, with regards to all that's happening. But, you know, I do want to preach in this way because I believe that there are people watching. I believe that there are people that need to hear the gospel message. And I'm trusting and I believe in the power of the gospel. Amen? Amen. So, yes, there's a ladder here, but we see why well, soon. The Lord will speak on shore and he speaks in various ways, uniquely sometimes. Um, but that's the way I want to even, that's the way I would like to go tonight. And I would ask you to prepare that slide, brother, if you don't mind. Gospel. You could get that slide ready. It's a message that I would like to go with tonight. You know, this is real, church. Amen. Do you believe it? Yeah. I believe that it's real. I know that it's real. It can touch my soul and touch many of your souls. And, and I've seen this happen so many times when God pours out His Spirit and pours out His Spirit in my way. And for those of you who are watching online, uh, I do apologize that we did have to cut it off. We did want to get more freedom in here. And, uh, it's not that we want to cut off services in the middle sometimes, so don't expect that to be an often thing where we cut the services off. But the Spirit of God is really moving, and the power of God in this place, uh, even while we're off one in a very real way, in a very strong way, and God has been moving in a very powerful way because it is true, the gospel is true, amen? Yeah. Believe it, church, amen? Yeah. As you touch your life, amen. Yeah. you feel His presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is there. I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 28. I'm going to read a fairly well-known portion of Scripture. Genesis chapter 28. Now I'll give you a moment before we look into this. Please, the gospel message. And let me say, already, if you're in your own, if you're somewhere watching online, feel free, of course, that the Lord is going to call you and you're calling you. And down through the weeks you can come. And I sense such a presence of the Lord here. To you give your heart to the Lord. The Lord is calling you. He's, he's pulling on your heart. And, and he wants to save everyone. And today is the day of salvation. Amen? Amen. It says in Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse 1. And all he called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go through Padanaram. To the house of the two of thy mother's father, and take thee away from thence of the daughters of the band, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram, unto Laban, son of the two of Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, out of Jacob's. And he saw his mother. Now turn to verse 10. Jacob went out from Beersheba, so where he's on his journey. And it says, And went toward Iran, and he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place, and bought them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to, sh to sleep. And he dreamed, and this is what he dreamed. It says, Behold a ladder, and it didn't look like this one, trust me. But behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. Isaac. So the Lord was on the top of this ladder in the dream. And he went on to say, The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee, and in thy seed shall the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I know it not. And he was afraid, and he said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured it all upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Walls at the first. And Jacob bowed up by saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, 
so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God, and the stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. Certainly the presence and the glory of God. Amen? Amen. I really sense the glory of God. Amen. I really sense the presence of God. Amen. Very interesting text. Uh, Jacob witnesses this sight. He sees something. And he sees something that he's never seen before. And he has this dream. And in this dream he sees this ladder that's it says, set up on the earth. And it reached into heaven. So it connected earth to heaven. And, and he says, this is not only about the house of God. This is the gateway of heaven. He just, this is divine revelation of this letter and, and there's a connection between earth and heaven. There's a connection between God and, and what's going on in the earth and the angels and what's going on in the earth. And, and I realize that the gospel is found even in this text, you know that? And it's found in a very deep way because there is a gateway and it's the gospel. Amen? Do you believe that, church? Amen. There is a gateway into heaven. There's a gateway to the throne of God. And, and it's the gospel message. And, and this is what I want to talk to you about tonight. The first point of the message. The first thing that I'd like to point out to you is this. That God is interested. Do you believe this church? God is interested in the affairs of humanity. He saw this. He, he saw this connection. He saw the reality that God was actually interested in what was going on on the earth. He, he saw that God actually had interest in even the sons of men. He saw that God actually had interest, in, interest in, in the very creation, the ones that He created. And He witnessed it. And I want to move on really quickly in this because it connects. If God is interested, then that means that God is involved. Do you believe that, church? You see, a lot of people, and you have a lot of different views in this world, you have a lot of different people that believe different things, and, and one of the views that you have is what's known as atheism. We've heard of it before, I'm sure. Some people believe that there is no God. Some people believe that God does not exist, but Scripture tells me, and God's Word tells me, that the fool says in his heart that there is no God. So basically, Scripture says only a fool would say that there is no God because there has to be a God because where did we all come from and where did this all come from? And, and a lot of people say, well, it had to be the Big Bang Theory or whatever it might be or, or come out of nowhere. Well, I did it come out of nowhere? I'll tell you the Big Bang Theory. God said that there'd be like a bang. There it was. <laughs> you see, the reality is that God is interested in humanity, he's interested in the affairs of humanity, and he's actually involved in the affairs of humanity. Now, people might believe that God does not exist, but, but, but we have different beliefs and different viewpoints, and, and there are a lot of people that believe other things, and there's other people, not just atheists, but then you have people that have the viewpoint of what's known as a deist. I don't know if you've heard of deism before. But deists believe that God exists, just that he is not ever interacted with humanity. He's somewhere way out there and he doesn't care about humans and he didn't create all things, but he's just some far off God that, that doesn't involve himself and he's not interested and he, and he doesn't really care and, and, and he's just not interacting with any lives. But let me tell you that God is interested and God is involved. Amen? You see, Jacob had this vision. He saw this. He saw this letter. And the letter was set upon the earth. And it reached into the heavens. And we, and we see the reality that God has been and is involved in humanity. He always has been. Do you believe it, church? Church reveals it. Now you're going to ask, how is he involved? But God has intervened. That's how he's involved. Do you believe it? God has intervened in many lives. And I want to just lay out some situations where God has intervened. You could go right back in the scripture and you would understand that God has intervened first of all and foremost by his angels. And there's such thing as angels. Angels do exist just as demonic spirits exist. There's a spiritual realm which we cannot see with the natural eye. And there's a reality that Satan is real and fights for people's soul to destroy them and cast them into hell for all of eternity. But on the other side, there's the iron of God, was the angels of God. And what Jacob saw was there were angels ascending up and down on this ladder. Now if you were to go down to Scripture, you would see there were many cases where these angels got involved in people's lives. Like, for instance, if you were to go to Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember what happened there. Judgment was coming down and God sent his angels in to spirit out his family and to hurry them and they escaped the wrath of God which was about to come down upon that place because
because of this wickedness. And why well, you see, I mean, is God is not just there hoping and saying, I'm not going to get involved or I don't care, but I'm actually interested and I'm involved and I'm involved through intervention. So I'm going to send my angels to save some. Amen? If we're going to move on from there, you'll see it happen in Scripture again. You remember when Elijah, Elijah found himself surrounded by the enemy? And a servant was what? And he was there and he looked at a servant that had no spiritual insight. And, and he stood up and, and as they were surrounded, he, he looked at him and he said, You know what? We're done for Elijah. All I see is all the enemy all around us. And Elijah cried and said, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see what truly is. And when his eyes was open, he looked upon the hills and what they didn't see, he saw so chariots of fire all around the enemy. And where the enemy had been surrounded, in reality, the enemy was surrounded. Amen. How many of you know that the enemy is surrounded? Amen. Amen. The enemy is surrounded. God got the enemy surrounded. God has never caught off guard. He's the one who's in control. If the devil was caught off guard, God is able to do what he wants to do. Amen? Amen. He uses his angels. Another situation, and you've seen it in Daniel, the book of Daniel. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. And, and what happened was there was an angel sent to shut the mouths of the lions. Another case, Daniel prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he sought the Lord. And you see what happened? He, he didn't, I don't know if he questioned, maybe he didn't, Daniel was a godly man. But he didn't get an answer to his prayer. But all of a sudden, after about 21 days, there showed up an angel. He said, the prince of Persia would help me, but, but from the day you sit your face to pray, Daniel, your prayer was heard. It was just a withholding that went on. But God always sent an angel. There was an intervention that happened in the lives of men. And God used angels to intervene. And we go on from there. You were to come through the life of Mary. You would understand that Mary was this young girl that was just out there living her life. And what happened was an angel appeared onto her and intervened in her life. And she, it, this angel said to Mary that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to give birth to a son and you're going to call his name Jesus. There was an intervention in Mary's life. God sent an angel and he was interested and he was taking action. Amen? Now I could go on from there with the angels, but let me move on to something a bit more. If God intervenes with angels, just as Jacob saw angels ascending and descending on that ladder, then I would go so far as saying that was God intervening using the agents that he wanted to use, but I would go so far as say that God intervenes himself personally. Amen? See, if you were to go back in the Old Testament, you would see it again. You were to go to the Tower of Babel, you would understand that man thought that they could exalt itself above God and reach out to the heavens. This was after the flood. So he builds this tower that reaches out to try to reach out to the heavens. In essence, what they were doing was they're saying, we're going to build a tower that's going to escape any future judgment that's going to come upon us. It's going to go to the heavens. So if the waters ever come down like it comes down and came down again, then, then it won't drown us. We won't be taken by surprise. And God looked down and saw that they were doing it. He intervened in the situation and he confused them and separated them. You see, God is interested and he's active in the affairs of humanity. The three little Abram children, we know the story. They were cast into the fiery furnace. It looked like they were going to be burnt to pieces and burnt to dead and because they wouldn't bow to kneel and need to, to worship the oil that had been raised up. And what happened was there was a, another one that was seen in that furnace. Amen? The pretty kind of person of Jesus Christ. And God intervened in the three little ch Hebrew children's life. And what he did was he, he saved them from the fire to the point that they didn't even smell like smoke. And not one ear on their heads was burned. Amen? Amen? Right through scripture, you will see it over and over again. But let me move on and say the greatest of all, and this is what I want to talk to you about here tonight, is the fact that yes, God is involved, God is interested, and He's interested in true intervention, and it's proven through the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You see, He saw this vision, Jacob saw this vision, He sees this ladder that's set up on the earth, and it reaches onto heaven, and I realized something, you know. To come down so low as to be upon the earth, but yet to be so high to be as to be in heaven, represents something. And this letter actually represents Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the only way into heaven. He is the only way to bridge that gap from earth to heaven. He's the only way that humanity can get into heaven. And, and it represents the reality that there's an incarnation that happened. That Jesus Christ. 
came to this earth and took upon himself the form of a man. Yes, he was fully man, but yet he ceased to be fully God. Amen? Amen. God said, you know, i got to do something. Man is sinful. Man is fallen. My man, is, man is pulled away from me because of his sin. There's a separation that has happened. And he, he's not in relationship with me. And because of that separation, death comes upon man. Not a just natural death that you see in this earth, but, but spiritual death. And, and this man is re reconciled to me and comes back into a relationship with me through my only way that I'm going to provide. And once that happens, then man is not only going to die in the natural, man is going to die in the spiritual. And that death is going to be eternal. It's going to be separated from me forever. And Jesus described it like this. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Eternal torment. And a place in all hell. That's what, that's what it describes. So God says, you know what? i got to intervene in the situation and the circumstance of man. i got to intervene in where man is. i got to intervene in what man is doing. i got to intervene in where they are. The only way I'm going to intervene in a situation is by sending my only begotten Son. So what he does is he sets a ladder up on the earth that reaches into heaven. Is that not what he done? You know, you know we've seen this song and, and, and let me just read it off to you. It's been sung so many times. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad I'm, you're, you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show, wait a minute, let's see a letter set up on the earth that extends into heaven and the Lord's on the top. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. This is the gospel message, church. This is what it is. That God is interested and He intervened for the situation of man. Because when Jesus came, He died upon that cross and He died to take the sins of the old world upon Himself so that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. It's the simplicity of the gospel and it still works. Amen. Well, the reason why we're feeling the glory and sense of the presence of God, and I feel the glory of God here tonight, I can really do it. You know the reason why we feel the glory of God? Because God intervened in our situation. God intervened in our life, and He intervened through Jesus Christ, our, our Lord and Savior. And what you see happening is Jesus being in the heavens, being on the top of that ladder, being on the throne of heaven. When He came down, He actually humbled Himself, Scripture says, and He became the form of a man. So now He's already exalted above all because the sacrifice was accepted for your sins. Take this for the record. We're all in sin. We're all separated from God. But Jesus Christ died so that you can come back into communion with God. And the only way, the only way you can get back in relationship with God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is the only way. When Jacob saw this, he was seeing a little bit more than a dream. He was seeing a revelation. He was seeing divine insight in the fact that God is involved and in intervening in the situations and the lives of people. Now, if that's the case, then God is intervening in our situations even today. Do you believe that, church? You know, when people get saved, you know what's happening? God is coming down to meet them right where they are, isn't it? The Spirit is moving upon them right where they are. God is meeting them in their situation because He sees where they are. I don't know where you find yourself. You might find yourself in the lowest of the low and in the toughest of the toughest. You might find yourself in the worst possible, possible spot that you could find yourself. You might find yourself in your home is wrecked and your marriage is wrecked and your, your children is all gone in some situation. And you find yourself in the drugs and alcohol and down about as far as you can go. But I know what is interested in where you are and to Bob him where you are, and he wants to intervene where you are, and he has intervened to Jesus Christ's son. That's what he has done. And no matter where you find yourself, if you will just simply allow him, that's all. You don't have to work it out first, you don't have to get it all straight first, you don't have to get it all in place first. Jesus is just calling and calling and calling and calling and calling. See, church, I just feel like preaching the gospel, right? That's the way I feel. I just feel like preaching Jesus Christ. This is the only thing that's going to work. It's Jesus. And He is the way. Let's preach Jesus. Let's preach salvation. Let's preach the glory of God. Jesus works. Jesus saves. 
Jesus. Yes. Sing it up with Jesus. Jesus. Yes, yes, he does. He is making you something new. When the sin that was, I'm going to change the words, no matter. It's all the same thing, glory to God. He'll change your heart. He'll reverse your soul. He'll give you life. And he'll make you new. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus does for his glory. What we see here tonight is real. He is the one. He is the Savior. And He wants to meet you right where you are. He is intervening. The reason why we got a church filled with people, the reason why we see lives change and lives honored, is because Jesus is still intervening in the lives of people. Do you believe it, church? Yeah. I love the story of Saul. Now, Paul, of course. His name was changed. But Saul was on Damascus Road and he was on his way to. Persecute Christians, one of the hardest dudes you could ever meet. He was. Killing Christians, having them thrown in jail, and coming where he meets and he was very religious. See, he thought he had it all together. He thought he had it all figured out. He thought he was all working in God's office. He was self righteous. He said, You know, I, 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 I'm a Pharisee, and in keeping the law, I've, uh, I've never felt I'm, I'm perfect in that way. I've done as good as I could do it. You read in the scripture. And the reality was, so he was on his way, thinking that he was doing God's service by having Christians heal him. He was on the guy I was known as Damascus Road. You know the story. And while he was on Damascus Road on that horse, there was a bright light that shot. And Paul fell off that other horse, didn't he? And he fell to the ground. And he says, there was a voice that cried out. He said, Paul, why persecutest thou me? You know what I see? I see God interested. And I see God intervening. Now some would say, why would God have mercy on such a man? That, that he would go around and actually murder Christians, God's own people, and God would show up in such a way. You know why? Because God loves people. And he wants to save people. And what happened to Paul was his life was turned upside down. You know why? Because he met Jesus on Damascus Road. It's Jesus that has saved your soul. He still intervenes in people's lives. Amen. I remember what I saw in Carlsville. Man, I've seen some hard situations turned upside down. I remember a brother, a guy, from the name, a guy by the name of Jason, lived in Carlsville, and he found himself in a hard situation. I remember one day I was going to one of the board members' house. And I was at their house, and when I left their house, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, Go down and visit what well, I've got, this elderly lady. So I left the house and said, I don't know, I'm going down and visit this elderly lady. So I go down to the house to visit the elderly lady, and when I get there, she's not there. She's gone to the hospital. The family is gone, all the family is gone. But here is the first encounter with Jason. You know what was God intervening in his life right there? So anyway, I spent, I don't know, a long time talking to him. He was talking to me about his situation. I got a chance to share my testimony with him. Time went on, and he didn't give his act to the Lord there. But then he found himself in a situation. And, and Jason, you see, he testified us. Was, was hooked on uh, things like cocaine. He was involved in gambling, gang gambling. And his life was in a mess. His home was basically being destroyed. He had a young boy. He had, he had a wife. And, and he also had a newborn baby on the way, just a little girl. And basically, everything was being completely destroyed and, and torn away from him, and all because of his addiction and the things that he found himself in. So we prayed for him, we prayed for him, and, and we saw a bit of change in his life, and he began to get off some things, and he attributed it to prayer, but yet he wouldn't say it, and he testified to the fact that he kept saying, you know, the thing that got me and that I can't get over is all the guilt that I'm, and all the shame that I'm carrying upon me. All that I've done wrong and all the ways that I went, even though he wasn't saved, I'm carrying this little guilt, Pastor, he used to say. This overwhelming weight of guilt is upon my shoulders. And I'll never forget the night that he came into that church in Collinsville during the revival. And he walked through that altar and gave his life to the Lord. And what he got to testify was this. He wouldn't only deliver it from the cocaine. He wouldn't only deliver it from all the drugs. He, he wouldn't only deliver it from all the situations. The Lord had not only healed situations in his life, but a testimony was this. It's one of the greatest testimonies you could have. He said, Pastor, I don't feel any guilt or any shame anymore. It's like it's all gone. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature. The Lord has taken it all away. Pastor Bissy went over to his house afterward during the move of God. And, and we went down and, and we went down because this young boy, only a young boy, about 9 or 10 years old, wanted to give his act to the Lord. Wanted us to come over, wanted us to come over to Gaddis, so we give his act to the Lord. God bless him. 
So we went in and we prayed, put that young side to the Lord right there. Then built his mother come out, found herself in the church, and she walked to the ladder and gave her act to the Lord. And all of a sudden, they had a whole house of salvation, and there's still more to say today. Just like the Lord is all in the name of the Lord. Glory to God. See, a lot of people got this idea that God is God is so far off. God is not interested in where I am. God doesn't care about me. God doesn't care about my circumstance. God doesn't care about my situation. God doesn't care about the things that happen to me. God doesn't care about the earth. God doesn't care about the pain. But let me tell you, according to the Bible I read, God cares about you. He loves you. And He sent His Son to die for you so that He can set you free. Yes, He cares about you. And He's intervening. He wants to save you. So I believe why he can't change my circumstance. He can't give me the hope. He can't do anything in my life. He can't give me peace. He can't give me joy. He can't break this addiction. He can't break this bondage. He can't set me free from the things that I'm bound to. He can't get me out of where I'm to. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that the Jesus I know can get you out of anything and everything. And he will get you out of it. God is inviting 
all of humanity, you come to the bottom of the ladder and look up. He said, I saw the Lord on the top, he said. I looked up and I saw something. Jacob saw this new and he realized there were angels that were ascending and descending on this ladder that, that reached into heaven. And the call of God is this to all of humanity to come and humble yourselves. What do you have to do? You have to get it all right. No, as the Spirit of God moves upon you and pulls upon you, and there's people that feel the pull of the Spirit, and they don't even understand what's going on in them. They don't understand why their heart is beating. They don't know the way that it is. They don't understand that there's this pull, there's this feeling of conviction where God is calling them to be saved. But God is calling them to be saved because He's inviting all of humanity, each and every one, to come to the ladder. But when you come to the ladder, the first thing you need to do, and Jesus set the example, the scripture says that he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a man. So he came to earth, didn't he? The only way that you can come to this ladder is you need to take the first step. There's only one step to salvation. is repent and believe. Amen. And in order to repent and believe, you've got to bow your knee to Jesus. You know that? You've got to grab hold to the first rock and you've got to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm separated from you. All I ask, God, is that you would forgive me. I believe that you, you sent your son, Father, to die upon that cross, and he died for my sins, and that he rose from the grave, and he ascended into heaven. I believe he's coming back again, God, and I trust in you that he is sufficient to bring me back into a relationship with you, Father. This is the way. It's only to cry out the name of Jesus, to cry out to God, and realize that you're in a position that you cannot get to heaven, not by good works, not by any other way. You can Climb up ladders you want. The only way to get into heaven is to come and humble yourself and tread upon that first step. It's the only way. You can't step over it. You can't get up any other way. The only way to get up there is to humble yourself before God and to cry unto the name of Jesus, realizing your situation and your circumstance, and say, Lord, nothing in my hands I bring. Send me to the cross, I bring. Save me, Jesus. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. Cry out to Him, and He'll answer your cry. He'll save your soul. He'll deliver you from where you are. Yes, He will. He'll meet you right where you are. No matter where you are, no matter what situation, you'll answer your prayer. Amen. That's what you'll do. Amen. You know, what happens then is a process. People try to get ahead, see? People think that you got to come and you got to be on the top before it comes to the bottom. But all you got to do is cry out to Jesus. And all of a sudden, something happens in your heart. Well, I cried out to Jesus and he got a hold of my life. And all of a sudden, I'm on my way to glory road. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Is that what happens? All of a sudden, you're getting exalted to the heavenlies, aren't you? All of a sudden, something's happening. There's a moment you cry out to Jesus, you're ready to that step right away, and He justifies you by faith. He looks at you and He says, I don't see your sin no more. I see my son Jesus. Therefore, you're set free to worship. You're set free to, to, to go and, and praise my name and pray to me. And then what happens, of course, at the same time is what's known as regeneration. He changes his heart. And at the same time is sanctification. And over time you become more and more and more like Jesus. Oh, glory to God. And one day, just because at one time you all of yourself, you didn't have to climb the ladder yourself. God got all of your life. And at one day you'll find yourself on the top of the ladder, glorified body of Hallelujah. There's a way to get there. 
and through Jesus Christ, in and in alone, He's able to save your soul. That's the invitation tonight. God is calling you. You might be here and you don't know the Lord. You might be wondering how does this involve me. Sure, just says this is today and today is salvation. No one's promised tomorrow. No one's promised another chance. God told us this in His Word. He's appointed on the amongst the dying in the judgment. Nobody knows when that's going to happen. I never forgot what happened to me going to college, God. Drove around up out of hats, drove down the turn out of hats, drove to all the big roundabouts, the worst kind, crazy. Traffic everywhere, the heaviest kind of traffic. Used to go downtown, drive around downtown, not a hitch, not a problem, not one accident. I come to Cottlesdale and I went down to Cottlesdale on crazy turns. <laughs> Brand new tires on all seasons. Missed ones at that. <laughs> and you know what? I come around the turn, I'm about 60 or 70. And as I come around the turn, all of a sudden she started to slide off the side of the road. And she hit the gravel. And I pulled her back, and that was it. Just pulled her back this way to get her back on the road. We put her on that side. I said, I got to pull her back. And as soon as I pulled her back, she swung around the other way and went right across the road. A little bit of snow on the top, black ice and on me. And she went in over here. I was going to clean over like this. I could have been gone. That could have been it. Right. And that happens to people. No one's promised them all. I know people went up to eternity. They're walking down the road and all of a sudden they take a massive heart attack. That's all I was doing. They take a massive stroke, that's all I was told. Something happens to their mind, and, and that's all I was told. They, 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 they just uh, lose out all together. They, they've heard the gospel, and they've had opportunities, and guess what? They're, they're not in heaven now, but yet they thought that one day they make that decision. I'm going to make that choice one day. Uh, I'm going to do it someday. Or, well, the well, word of God tells me, and I promise them that, <coughs> that today, today is salvation. Not only the fact that the rapture could happen at any time, we're talking about revival. There's going to be a revival, all right? Because there's going to be a revival in heaven. Amen? Amen. When the Lord comes and takes his bride, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a glorious revival. There's going to be shouting and praising. You won't have to worry about none of that then. Amen? Can you see him coming, brother? You know, shut it up. That's it. That's what it's going to be doing. There's going to be a revival. There's going to be a money move of God. I think there's going to be a revival where I'm not saying that to counteract anything. But in the midst of all of that, we know that the Lord could return at any time. That's what we preach. That's what we believe. I believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That one day, all of a sudden, we're going to find ourselves at the top of the ladder in the twinkling of an eye. And then, amen. Amen. Yes, I believe that church. Amen. amen. See, no one's promised tomorrow. No one's guaranteed that there's a another time that you can make a commitment to Christ. No one's guaranteed this. And the, and the God of Spirit is to invite people to come out of me and give their hearts to Jesus and be saved and experience the best thing this life and beyond could ever offer. Let me end by saying this. I said it during the revival meeting there many times. If I were to have two contracts, and let me pop this out before you, I, I, I we so run for natural things, but in the spiritual, you know, we need to hear what the Spirit says. You know? If I were to lay out two contracts right now on this altar, and for everybody out there online listening, and for anybody here listening, if I were to lay two contracts on this altar right now, two contracts it, that you come and you sign your name to this contract, and you'll get a million dollars instantly, and you knew it was true, and you were going to get it, this why you would run and you'd sign your name in an iron. Am I right? The other contract says if you sign that one, then you're going to lose everything. Everything's going to be taken from you. You're never going to get nothing back if you sign this other contract. If you sign this other one, then you get a million dollars. You'll be gone. Which one you sign? There's not one person who would say that you sign the one where you lose everything. You sign the one for a million dollars. I bet you. I'm right. I know. <laughs> That's in the match. Now, there's two contracts they have. One is for eternal glory and eternal life in the presence of God for all of eternity through the Son Jesus Christ. The best life you could ever live, no regrets. 
I got no regrets in giving my heart to the Lord. He took me from darkness and popped me in the light. He took me from death and popped me in the life. That's what he did. He took me off a road over the wrong path down the door tell and popped me on a road and walked me way to heaven. Going to be in glory with him. That's what he done. I got no regrets, none at all. And what he set before us is two ways, two choices, two chances. Which are you going to take is one or the other. Are you going to take and sign a contract where you're going to have an eternal glory? Are you going to give your life to Jesus? Or are you going to reject it? Are you going to say no? Are you say, you know what? I don't want none of this. I'm going to sign the other contract. I understand the other contract leads to death. Because the wages of sin is dead. That's what scripture says. That's what we get. Jesus paid the price. Amen? I'm going to ask the musicians to return. We are going to take a moment to do an honor call in this place. And I don't know, church, if somebody at the board of this place was a point where I'm not saying it, but a point there where I felt that I was going to go through ground. I really did. The power of God in this place. All we got to do is jump in and sit there. All we got to do is jump in. The Lord has spoken quite clearly. And there's a move of the Spirit. There's a real move of the Spirit. But right now, God is calling. You might be in your home, you might be either watching on television or wherever you might be. And I just ask you that you would actually take the step. You would actually take the step and turn your life to Jesus. As the Spirit of God calls you here right now, as He deals with your heart, He's dealing with you with His senses. I ask you to turn your life over to Him. That's what He's asking you, you know. He's calling you to come to the bottom of the ladder. There's an holy moment here right now. There's a reverence. There's an holy us even in this place, you know. There's an holy us. Understand that the Lord is high and lifted up, and there's none above him. He has saved your soul and you deliver him. Hear the voice of the Spirit. Come on to him, he'll save you and he'll deliver you. He'll set you free. The musicians are going to lead us. Sherry and Marlon as well. Going to lead us in a number at this time. As they lead us in the number, this hour is open. You might be in your own. You might feel to get up and come on into this place. You know, there's a tide for I'm going to speak about this again sometime very soon. There's a tide for So I know the Lord has been dropped something real deep into my eye and I haven't shared it, but I got to share it. And I know that's a message. And uh, it's going to be more of a declaration. And it's what the Spirit of God is saying. But every voice of the Spirit is a toy for them. There's a toy that's pulling you that wants you to come to this hour. It wants you to give your life to Him. You're, you're in your own, you're in some situation, you don't know how you're going to get past or true or where the mountain seems to be. And the Spirit of God is saying, you know what, I see you where you are, I, I know where you are. And I'm able to deliver you. It's calling you, you can sense it, you can sense the anointing, you can sense the Spirit of God upon you. So as they sing this song, maybe you want to make your way to this church. You want to come on into this building. Maybe you want to bow your knee right where you are and cry out to Jesus. You make sure you let us know that you did that. Because you need people to lift up your arms. You need people to surround you and, and be there for you in situations. No one's to all to themselves. You make sure you let us know. God will do a work in your life if you surrender to him. Run that. We can sing a couple songs at this time. An invitation song, a song to invite. If you want to ask Jesus into your heart, nothing more I'd like to see than someone to come on into those doors. The people that's here want to come to the side, nothing more I want to see than people be saved. Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about. Right. As glorious as the time was, and I think we're in for a glorious time. I think we're standing for a glorious time here tonight for your life feels here. I really do. I want to see people saved. Yeah. And that's the cry of the Spirit.
Amen. Amen. The ladder is set up on the earth. You know, I just I just thought about it. You ever see those just before we sing, you ever see those situations or shows or whatever? I don't know if you're watching and looking at the phone and say, I don't know if it's the right time or not. Remember the movie Home Alone? I don't know if you went up in the attic at some point or not. You remember those old ladders you used to be able to pull them up? On the ladders. The ladders set up on the earth now. But there's a point in time where the ladders are going to pull up. Right now is extended the hand of God and His mercy. And is extended right down to earth to His Son Jesus Christ. But there's coming a time when that hand is going to be pulled away. And there's going to be no way to get in. The scripture tells us that. It is a serious thing. It really is. I'm going to ask you to sing a song. Jesus
at least not for long periods of time. Sometimes you start to look in the natural or the enemy of law here or stuff like that and you'll feel a little bit down and you know every now and then you'll feel like something's trying to come against you but in the big picture, in the big idea, I know that God is going to have his church and have his wife. So if you need the Lord, you know what you need to do. The gospel's been preached over and over and over. I believe it's time for response. Amen. Thank you for joining us online. I am going to dismiss once again our online audience.